what's up youtube this is the 82 and old podcast welcome back today we're going to talk about one of the most important games in history which unfortunately a lot of people today don't know about so i'm talking about the 1948 globe trotters versus lakers exhibition game so for those of you who don't know the los angeles lakers as we know today, used to be called the Minneapolis Lakers. And so way, way, way back before the NBA, it was called the BAA because you got to understand there was a league called the BAA that merged with the basketball league prior to that called the NBL. This would create what we know now today as the NBA in 1950. But what you have to know is the Los Angeles Lakers, which were the Minneapolis Lakers at the time, they actually started out in the NBL before jumping ship over to the NBA a year prior to the merger. So they won a championship in the NBL and then they would go on and win one in the NBA. Now, this time, uh, this is prior to any of their recognized NBA championships. So, I just want to put that out there. So, this is coming off of their uh, NBL championship. So, anyways, the idea of the game was held for February 19, 1948. And the, the owner of the Globetrotters, his name was Abe Saperstein. And the Lakers general manager, Max Winter. Now, these guys were actually friends. And they believed it would be good for fans to see this. And the Lakers are, you know, a year old at this point. And the uh, Harlem Globetrotters are approximately 20 years old at this time. For those of you who don't know, I'm going to eventually do a video on the Harlem Globetrotters. They originally started on the south side of Chicago in 1926. And it was a bunch of high school players that formed this team. And they would play in black leagues. And their original name was the Savoy Big Five. And how they got this name is they played at the Savoy Ballroom, which opened up in January of 1928. And it was originally just a black NBA team, right? Because during the time, teams were segregated. So many black players couldn't go to these professional leagues. And you saw that in the MLB too. So what they did is they created their own leagues. And the Harlem Globetrotters would go on to be known as, I'm sure most people know them today as this, um, as just entertainers. You know, they put on a show every time they play. But they were also a team. A lot of people don't realize that. And um, they would tra they would change their name to the Harlem Globetrotters because the Harlem Globetrotters, you know, they had connection with the Harlem Renaissance during the time. Globetrotters, I've heard two different stories on how they came up with that name, but Saperstein selected the name Harlem because it was considered the center of black American culture and the name Globetrotter to mythanalyze the name. So, they would have success all through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And the BAA, which just formed, had a rule that they wouldn't allow any black players. And I do believe the NBL had black players, but it was very limited, you know? And as crazy as this sounds, I know this sounds mind-boggling and stupid today. The general consensus at the time of this 1948 game was, and I don't mean to offend anybody. These are not my views. This is, this is what, <laughs> this is what people at the time thought. They thought that black people weren't able to play basketball because they said they weren't, they didn't have the mental quickness for basketball. How, how fucking absurd is that? <laughs> you know I mean Michael Jordan, LeBron James come on we know this today obviously and we would have known it back then too but there was a lot of racist idiots back then 
So many sports fans and team owners and coaches did not want to see teams integrated. Some held the racist views that were, that they weren't equipped for sports. And in 1941, Dean Cromwell, the assistant head coach for the U.S. track team of the 1936 Olympics, which included Jesse Owens, wrote that black athletes ex- excelled in certain events because they were closer to primitive men than white men were. How freaking absurd is that? You know? So, pretty much they're saying, if you're good at... They're not good enough at sports. Oh, but if they are good enough, that's all they're good at because they're primitive. They're not intellectual. That's just fucking absurd. It pisses me off. But that's why this game was so important because a lot of people counted the Harlem Globetrotters out. Uh, They thought George Mikan who was coming off of a championship not only with the NBL Lakers, but he won a championship the year prior to that with the American Gears of the NBL. So he was considered the greatest basketball player of all time at this point. And they also had another Hall of Famer in Jim Pollard. So um, so imagine, don't look at this in your modern context, right? Look at this game of the time. It was pretty much black players trying to prove that they are just as capable of playing the game as a white person. So so they play the game, and here's what happens, right? You got to understand that prior to this game, basketball wasn't near as popular as it is today. Um, the usual NBA game, from what I've read, attracted about... I, I don't mean NBA, BA, I'm sorry. Attracted about 9,000 fans per game, right? And this exhibition game attracted nearly 18,000 people. And the Glow Trouter starting lineup was a, co- a combination of the best black players in the country at this time. They had Reese Tatum, who, you know, his nickname was Goose. Look him up. Very talented player. Marquise Haynes. Ermer Robinson, Wilbur King, Louis Presley. They weren't no joke, man. And, uh, you know, this Lakers team, like I said, had Jim Pollard, uh, George Mikan. And many people counted them out. And during the first half, Laker fans had reason to be suspicious or boastful, I should say. They, Because they got out to a quick 9-2 lead, and the Lakers held a huge height advantage over the Globe Trotters. Uh, several, you know, for example, you know, George Mikan was 6'10", and Haynes was very, barely 6 feet tall. Tatum turned out to be no match for Mikan in the Lakers' center. And Mikan would score 18 points in the first half, and he held Tatum to no points at all. So at halftime, the Lakers led 32-23. to 23. And during the break, Saperstein and his team devised a plan to defend Mikan with two men instead of one. They also decided to fast break the ball each time they got the ball to tire the Lakers out. Because, you know, the Globe Traders were in really great shape. They were used to running, 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 and playing games every night for as long as they could remember at this point. And the strategy worked because Tatum and Presley, they tired of Mikan out. And he they held him to only six points in the second half. And the Globetrotters tied the game for the first time in the third quarter. And they led only to watch the Lakers come back and tie the score. Now, going into the final quarter, both Tatum and Presley fouled out. Because they were guarding Mikan so much that they kept getting a lot of fouls on him. The rest of the team picked up, though. With 90 seconds left, the Lakers tied the game at 59 with a free throw. When the Globe Trotters got the ball, Marquise Haynes, who earlier in the game had teased the Lakers by dribbling while laying down on the court, he dribbled to run out the clock because there was no shot clock at the time. This was easy for Haynes to do because, think about it, man. Like, there's no shot clock. He could just run up and down the court with it. And they would eventually win the game 
off of a buzzer beater, 61 to 59. So this kind of changed the racial landscape of basketball. Not right away, of course, because you got to understand the racial implications of this. Um, so, for example, just two years later in 1950, three former Globetrotters became the first black players in the NBA. Because then 1950, when they merged, the NBA struck down these racial uh, rules in the NBA. So they drafted Chuck Cooper, the Boston Celtics, which the Boston Celtics were always progressive. I love that. Uh, they drafted Chuck Cooper of the New York Knicks. Uh, or I'm sorry. <laughs> he went to the Celtics, and the New York Knicks got Nat Clifton. And he he would also have a great career in the Harlem Globetrotters. And the Tri-City Blackhawks, which today are known as the Atlanta Hawks, took Hank Dizzoni. So this was three black players in the 1950 draft. And I want to mention, too, that the Harlem Globetrotters throughout the 50s would produce a lot of other great black NBA players like Connie Hawkins, Wilt Chamberlain, you know, Woody Salisbury. So you got to think, right? This game, although it wasn't an official NBA game, changed the racial dynamics in the NBA and made it better because many people who criticized early basketball, like 1940s, early 1950s, they said it was too slow, not athletic, and when they started getting black players in the league, you know, these players I mentioned weren't superstars in the league. Chuck Cooper wasn't a superstar. Uh, Nat Clifton wasn't a superstar. But as the 50s would go on, teams started to realize, you know, you're not going to win unless you draft black players, unless you get black players. And think about it like this, right? When the Boston Celtics got Bill Russell in 1956, they traded for him because St. Louis Hawks, who drafted him, they threw a hissy fit when they drafted him, the players on the team and the fans, because St. Louis was the last team to have that rule that you can't have any black players on the team. And it was kind of an unofficial rule. I don't mean like the team's policy had it in the rule book or anything. I mean, players on the team said they were going to refuse to play if Bill Russell played. And fans said they would boycott the team if they bring Bill Russell in. And so Bill Russell goes to the Celtics. He's traded. And the Celtics say, you know, Red Auerbach famously said, I don't care if he's purple. He drafted, we drafted him. He's going to play. And they were rewarded with championships, right? And the 1958 Atlanta Hawks were the last NBA team that was all white to win a championship. And that just goes to show you how the NBA changed. It started to evolve during this time. And by the 60s, hey, it was already over with. You know, you had Will Chamberlain, Oscar Robertson, uh, Willis Reed. Had, you know, late 60s, Kareem was drafted there in 69, obviously. I mean, Sam Jones was there in the late 50s, Casey Jones. You know, just, it, it was inevitable. And going into the 70s, you know, it just became more predominantly African American. And going into the 80s, you know, you had Magic Johnson, who was the face of the league. Going in the 90s, you had Michael Jordan. So none of this is possible if it wasn't for this game. Because this game between the Globetrotters and the Lakers showed the masses that black players are just as gifted as white players. And, and today it sounds crazy to think black people can't play basketball. But this was the consensus of fans during the time. And this changed their mind. 
And this started showing GMs that, hey, we need to draft black players in order to win. And they made the game much more exciting, you know? Elgin Baylor, who I didn't mention yet for a reason, for example, in the 50s when he was drafted, he increased popularity for the Lakers. He saved the Lakers franchise from folding. And his athleticism made it fun to watch. Julius Irving is another great example. His game made it fun to watch. Nobody wanted to watch these low scoring, run around, no shot clock games. So if you didn't have black players, you you wouldn't have the NBA today. It wouldn't even be around. So that's why this game is so important. And that's why I made this video. So let me know what you guys think down below. Thanks for watching.